Hello and welcome to another submarine chat. This one is going to be a question and answer. I'm going to respond to some of the questions that were asked um, on Twitter. Uh, like all my other videos, it's unscripted. You can probably tell that already, but I have prepared some materials. I can't get to every question that people ask, but hopefully these are interesting. Um, I'll also try to make it much quicker than last time. So the first question is, what is the biggest difference in the new Cold War undersea battles versus the Cold War classics? And this, this is an old picture from the old Cold War, not by me, this illustration, but you can see where I get my influences from for my drawings. Um, I think there's quite a few differences. There's also a lot that is the same. But let's focus on what's different. The first and really obvious one is the countries, the adversaries to um, the West, uh, to NATO and its allies. In place of Soviet Union, we have Russia. And that feels like the same adversary, essentially, certainly in the submarine context. But we also have China. So where the Cold War is going to be played out in the underwater domain is slightly different to the, the previous Cold War. Russia, of course, is at the top here. And the really hot area right now is the Arctic. I should say I drew these maps. You know, I didn't take more than five seconds to, to color the areas. So the, the lines aren't exact, you know, but the Arctic, you get that. That's really hot for submarine activities. Also, of course, the North Atlantic, including Norwegian Sea and the Pacific, mostly the North Pacific. Obviously, Russian submarines can go further. Um, in essence, they can go anywhere, but these are the main relevant uh, sort of hunting grounds for Russian and NATO or Western aligned submarines in the new Cold War. Also, the Baltic, Mediterranean, Black Sea, and thanks to a base in Sudan, potentially in um, uh, the you know, sort of the Gulf of Aden and that area, there's parts of the Indian Ocean, the old Cold War. But China, as you know, is over here. And the really hot area for China is the South China Sea and its immediate waters. I think that it could expand its submarine operations and take that Cold War into much of the Indian Ocean as much as it wants. And the again, the North Pacific. This is quite interesting. It means that much more of the world service is likely to be, you know, the hunting ground, as it were, for Cold War submarine operations. It's much bigger. The other challenge I see broadly is that there's some indecision over who the next Cold War should be against from the Western perspective. Is China the new Cold War or is or is Russia, or both of them? Are they part of the same axis or are they independent countries? I think they're independent countries, by the way. You know, I think there's a real danger here. We're essentially fighting two Cold Wars from a Western perspective. Other differences. The first one is gonna be submarine quality. For most of the Cold War, a lot of submarines on both sides were not very stealthy. And I mean quality in, in sort of threat terms. Um, towards the end of the Cold War, um, most Western submarines were very stealthy and some Russian submarines were very stealthy. But that will be different. I think the starting point, all Western submarines are extremely stealthy and all uh, Russian submarines are extremely stealthy. I'm not saying which one's better, which one, you know, and so on, but they are of a very high standard. And I think the Chinese submarines will also increasingly be very stealthy. That will lead to a switch in submarine tactics, in particular the use of active sonar. Active sonar has always been there. It's always been important. It's often played down a bit in Cold War context um, because it's better to detect someone passively I, just by listening than to emit your own active sonar and give your own position away in the process. But because submarines are getting so much quieter and harder to track by passive means, you can foresee the use of active sonar becoming more important again. That's a nuanced topic, but that's how I see it. Another factor is that 
since the Cold War, obviously submarine forces, submarine building has suffered in some countries more than others. But anti-submarine warfare has also, ASW has also suffered. There has been something of a neglect of it. Uncrewed underwater vehicles, UUVs, AUVs, that sort of thing. Also, to an extent, uncrewed air vehicles, I think will be a distinct difference to the previous Cold War. Um, they're going to become more common. It still feels like we're on the cusp of that. I mean, I'm a promoter of that topic, but, uh, you know, it'll take a few years to actually see it. And, of course, there'll be a long time before they're truly taking the place of, of regular crude submarines but they'll be part of the picture from the start massive amounts of data this is interesting one of the challenges modern sensors modern computing you know as you get better then you generate more data and the amount of data both in the submarines themselves and in the system is going to be ginormous um, a lot of that is intelligence data a lot of that will be you know, environmental data around the sea and things like that. Um, but the amount of data will just be ginormous. And that is, is topic in itself. Um, I think people underestimate that. The last one is open source intelligence and other forms of intelligence. The intelligence picture was really important in the old, in the previous Cold War, and lots of intelligent, uh, really interesting things were done in the new Cold War. There's a lot more of it. Now, open source intelligence is not very good at tracking a submarine underwater. So I'm not suggesting that that is how you detect a submarine, but it is part of the bigger picture around submarine operations and knowing which submarines are at sea and so on. Um, it's different. And what's interesting there is it democratizes intelligence. There is no good reason why the leading powers will necessarily be better at it than any other country on earth. Um, and I think it changes a lot of things. Okay, so the next question, the, this leads on to it because the next question is how well can submarines be detected or tracked from space? And so the main technology that we're talking about is the ability of satellites to measure the average height of the water um in different places of the world because the amount of water is actually influenced just slightly by the the um the seafloor for example if you have a seamount there will be a slight rise in the water level over that seamount it might be very small but it can be measured by satellites and so there is a concern that the same is true of submarines and essentially the wake of a submarine could be detected in this way and there'll be a lump over where the submarine is traveling and it will, you know, and so on. I think it's a very valid concern. I think it's definitely a technology that navies and, and governments should be looking into and investing in. I'm sure they are. The general view that I go along with is that this is not as easy or as prevalent or as um, ultimate as people are portraying it to be. I don't think this makes us the ocean transparent and it has to be looked at in lot, you know, with a lot more. Um, but it's really interesting technology and it shouldn't stop people from trying. At the end of the day, submarines will always be harder to find than surface ships. I think it'd be, you know, you have to think of very contrived scenarios when that's not the case. So however, dangerous it becomes for submarines is more dangerous for surface ships. I think that's a, a pretty good um, assessment. Can SSBN, so that's nuclear powered ballistic missile submarines, launch submarine launch ballistic missiles on the move or do they have to stay still? Um, easy way to answer that is this brilliant picture I, I found. I just happened to come across it. I, I love these pictures from the Soviet military power series. This is from the 80s. It's a Typhoon class submarine. Um, and you can see it's launching a missile while underway and submerged. Yes, um, ballistic missile submarines can and do launch their missiles while they're going along underwater. They can also do it on the surface. And if they're able to hover, if they're able to stay still in the water, they're able to do it that way as well. Um, but they can absolutely fire, shoot their missiles while they're underway.
In fact, it's quite normal. Really interesting question here. Commenters sometimes bring up the US giving the UK nuclear reactor technology. What subtech went the other way? Um, not just nuclear tech, not nuclear reactor and propulsion technology, but also um, the Plara system, the nuclear missiles, now the Trident. Um, so the UK's the Royal Navy has benefited greatly from American research and technology, and some of that technology and knowledge opinions has been transferred. But some of it also went the other way, right back to those same times. So the, the nuclear reactor technology was first given to the UK in the 50s, um, becoming effective in the early 60s. And about that time, the UK, the Royal Navy, well, um, figured out something really important. Um, raft mountings for engines and other equipment. And it was actually first introduced, at least this is how I've, how I've read it in, in sort of history books, as it were. Um, it was first introduced on the ton class minesweepers because of a fear of acoustic mines, Soviet acoustic mines. Um, but that same technology could then be translated into submarines. And so from the 60s, um, it meant that Western submarines, um, Royal Navy and US Navy submarines became quieter. And it was implemented on submarines about the same time, but it comes from the UK. And of course, within both countries, there's been developments and the raft mountains we see today are very different from the ones that were there in the 1960s. Um, but the, the, you know, it came something that came from the UK. This is much more modern examples, not the same module, but you can see the similarities. Um, there's from an astute class production and Virginia class production. Both these pictures are um, publicly released and not, not classified or anything like that, but they, they do give away the, the idea. You're mounting the insides of a submarine increasingly in, you know, insulated, sound insulated from the outside of the submarine to reduce the amount of noise that's transmitted out. Other countries also did this going back a long time, um, but today there's particularly noteworthy in France, in Russia, um, in Sweden, for example, and I'm sure most other countries, to be honest. Another example of technology, the, the last one I'm going to highlight, very overt sort of shift was pump jet propulsors. The Royal Navy started this in, I think, the 1970s. Um, HMS Churchill was a test bed. It wasn't, she wasn't so a nuclear powered submarine um, with a US reactor, essentially, uh, made in the UK, of course. But she was used as a trial boat for a pump jet propulsor. The US, there were people thinking about this at the time. So it's not to say that the US uh, wasn't aware of thinking in these terms, but it was the UK who did it. And from the Swiftsure class forward, all British nuclear powered submarines have had a pump jet propulsor. It was the um, Seawolf class, and this is one of them, special one, but this is a Seawolf class submarine that introduced it in the US Navy in the 90s. So 80s sort of adoption, 90s build. So it's something that went from the Royal Navy first to the US Navy at a time when the Royal Navy was very secretive about it. Now there's no, everyone knows this pump jet on submarines. In the 80s, it was definitely the sort of thing of speculation and whispers. Um, should importantly say that the pump jets on US submarines are not just British pump jets. As I understand it, and I, I might be wrong here, but as I understand it, they are US designs. Um, so... So they're not, it's not literally sending a, a pump jet over, in, but in the post, as it were. There are other things, I'm sure, lots and lots more technologies going both ways. But I think these are very good examples. And as great as US uh, Navy submarines are, some aspects are owed to Royal Navy and equally the other way. Brilliant question here. Um, different different types of cruise missiles that can be launched from submarines. This makes me want to write an article on this, um, listing all the types and which countries have them. There's some really interesting examples. Some are less obvious than others. But to answer it here, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about four different types 
or categories of missile. The first one I'm going to call regular sized anti-ship missiles. That's not a, you know, that's not a term anyone else would, would use. But for the sake here, think of these as your harpoon, exocet, um, the, the export versions of caliber, which are for anti-ship, that sort of thing. Um, these are launched from the torpedo tubes and they are, are very effective, um, but they come with a lot of limitations. Their physical size is somewhat smaller than a torpedo. Their range, I mean, it's the same as a, a surface launched harpoon or exocet. Um, consequently, their range isn't that great. And the thing is, the targeting of them is very difficult. So even if the missiles range is longer, the engagement ranges are much shorter than you'd see advertised, your specs you'd see in books. But these fell out of flavor in some navies, US Navy particularly, um, in recent years, but now they're coming back. And other navies, Russia, um, China, and a lot of countries which operate submarines see these as a really important part of the arsenal. The second category are similar, but much bigger. And the difference there is that when the missile gets really big and you can't launch it through your torpedo tubes, you have to build your submarine around it. And that's what you see with the Oscars class. In a modern sense, only the Russians operate this type of submarine and this type of missile. Um, and they're moving away from it, to be honest. Um, but really big sub missiles, much more devastating if they hit you. The other two categories are interesting, land attack cruise missiles. The classic example is the Tomahawk. This is actually not a Tomahawk, though this picture at the top is a South Korean one. Um, typically launched from the torpedo tubes, although also launched from vertical launch tubes, but of a size that can be launched from torpedo tubes if you choose to do it that way. Okay, and the last category are nuclear armed cruise missiles. These in practice tend to be similar to the land attack cruise missiles, but with a nuclear weapon warhead and they're used as part of a nuclear deterrent only two countries are thought to use this they are um, israel and pakistan should you know caveat that israel's not declared as a nuclear power and it's only rumors but you know i think everyone thinks it's true um pakistan is planning to do it and and might have a limited capability already um, with their home homegrown um, cruise missile. So they are the four categories of missile, but there's a lot of examples, really interesting topic. Final one, not very serious, but what is your favorite sub film and why is it Crimson Tide? It's not Crimson Tide, it's Das Boot. Um, I prefer the German original, and in fact, I think the TV series is a bit longer than some of the edited, yeah, the film versions. Um, I, you know, look up the original 1981 German it is unbeatable. If you haven't watched it, highly recommended. Not the only good film out there. Another one, which I can't not mention is of course, The Hunt for Red October. These are definitely my top two personally, um, but feel free to disagree. Okay. So thank you for listening. Hopefully this was easier to digest than the Q and A I did before, which was a lot longer. Um, please do ask questions. I, from time to time, I'll try to get around to answering them. Hopefully you found it interesting. Check out my website and please share this if, if you think other people would be interested. Mm -hmm.